All right, hello, welcome everybody. My name is Bo, I'm here with Ace Lab. We're helping out presenting today's event. Um, it's presented by Jennifer at Tanemic um, on environmental regulations for specifying paint and coatings. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick little intro about Ace Lab while folks are joining, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the CEU portion of today's course. All right, so I'm gonna start off with just showing you um, how to get to Tanemic on Ace Lab so you can ask questions directly after today's event. So everyone who signed up for today's webinar automatically had an Ace Lab account made for them. It's completely free to use. So definitely go check it out after today's event to uh, you know see all of the free services that we're offering for architects. Um, first today, I just wanna show you uh, if you know exactly the manufacturer you're looking for um, or the product category you're looking to search, you can go ahead and type it into the search bar at the top. It'll cross search between product categories, brands and resources. Um, so you can go ahead and click that, head over to Tanemic's page on Ace Lab and you can use this handy contact button to get in touch with Jennifer directly. So if after today's webinar, you've got some follow-up questions, you wanna connect about a project, this is a great place to come. You can get in touch with their team directly um, and have conversations directly over Ace Lab. To show you where to find that conversation, over here, you've got your workspace. So if you hover over workspace, you can see projects, conversations, and products. Um, so it's really great to use this as a way to communicate with manufacturers because you can keep all of your research organized in one place and tie it to your projects as well as the uh, libraries of products that you can save and build out. So to jump over to conversations, just quickly show you. Here you can see an overview of all of the conversations that I'm having on Ace Lab, uh, the manufacturer that it's with, um, the project that it's tied to, and the last activity date. Um, so if you have any questions about using Ace Lab for your product research, some of the other services and uh, things that we provide, feel free to uh, book a meeting. I'll send over a link to um, my colleague Helen's meeting in the chat momentarily so that you can book a free 15 minute session with her directly. Um, and one other thing to note is that we also have a live chat. It's staffed by real people um, with architectural backgrounds. So you can use this anytime um, after today's webinar if you're using Ace Lab. Uh, you know, trying to get in touch with Tanemic, have any questions, feel free to use this live chat, reach out to our team. Um, that's staffed by our team of experts who are there to help you uh, to do your product research and use Ace Labs tools. All right, a few housekeeping items. Um, first off, just want to say that uh, we will be reporting uh, credits directly to AIA, and we did ask for AIA numbers upon registration. I'll also send over a form in the chat brief in a few moments so that um, if you are worried you forgot to include your AIA number, you can uh, give it to us there during today's live event. Um, other than that, just really wanna encourage folks to please submit questions to the Q&A throughout today's webinar. Um, we'll have a record of those questions so that if we don't get to it during today's webinar, we can follow up with you after today's event. Um, but we always love to be able to, you know, get some audience engagement and talk to some folks um, before we leave the live event. So I'll also mention that um, when we get to the Q&A portion, if you want to ask a question out loud, you can raise your hand. I'll keep my eye on any hands raised um, and we can unmute you. You don't have to turn video on. Um, but if you have a long-winded question or a project-specific question, that can be a great way to do it if you don't feel like typing it all out into the Q&A. All right, um, that is it for me and for my housekeeping. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for the chat where I'll send over some links in a moment. Um, but other than that, just wanna say thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us today. And uh, feel free to go ahead and get started with today's event whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thanks, Bo. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as Bo mentioned, I'm with the Tanemic Company. And if you guys are not aware of who Tanemic is, we are a high-performance coatings manufacturer that specialize in coatings, um, long-term, um, superior protection, long life cycle, um, and lowest life cycle cost type of products that um, offer protection for all types of substrates and exposures. So that's anything from um, architectural steel, architecturally exposed structural steel, um, interior floors and walls, um, really concrete. Um, we have we have a, a over 250 coatings for different applications. So, um, and we sell our coatings through independent sales agencies across the country. Um, and we can go into more of that after the presentation, but um, since 
Uh, I think a lot of you might not be aware of who Tanemic is. I just wanted to give an overview of that. So now um, I will start by um, going over the today's presentation, which is titled Environmental Regulations When Specifying Paints and Coatings. Tanemic is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects, and as Bill mentioned, credit earned on the completion of today's presentation will be reported to AIA for credit. This is also a copyrighted presentation. Um, the course is going to cover um, uh, an understanding of the complexities when specifying performance-based coatings um, with regards to environmentally sensitive projects. And it will help you guys to understand how to interpret the changing legislation throughout the country and the air districts, as well as the requirements of voluntary programs such as LEED and other government mandated environmental control measures. The learning objectives are to provide an overview of current and future regulations of the various air districts throughout the United States and Canada and how the industry is changing to meet the challenge. We'll describe how high performance coatings can be used on environmentally focused programs, discuss specification requirements and life cycle assessments of long-term performance coatings and the resulting impact on the environment, and also help you to understand the regulations and how they can vary significantly from region to region depending on um, the coding and whether that's applied in the shop or in a field application. So I'll go over the air district VOC requirements for paints and coatings, the environmental requirements for paints and coatings and discuss um, in detail about those programs and explain some of the terminology. We'll go over specifications and what that looks like, as well as documentation for sustainable programs and what's required. And then we'll end with a review and questions. <clears throat> Regarding the air district regulations for paints and coatings, it's important. To, so before um, we start, actually, we're going to, I wanted to do a quick poll um, just to kind of see everyone's level and where they're at. On an annual basis, how many LEED or other sustainable rating system projects does your firm work on? And the options are less than 10, between 11 to 20, and then more than 20. We'll give you a, a, a few seconds to, to answer on that. All right, looks like we've got a good number of responses. Uh, do you want me to share the results? Yeah, that would be great. All right. Okay, it looks like the majority um, work on less than 10 and um, about 9% between 11 to 20, and then 3% more than 20. So it, it appears that um, the majority don't work on that many lead projects on a, a regular basis, but um, it's still important to know, you know, how paints and coatings um, meet those requirements, whether a project's getting certified within LEED or one of those other rating systems or, or just building per, per those requirements. So, okay, before we go into um, a great deal of detail, I wanted to kind of go over the composition of a coating and what that looks like. So, the Paints, basic ingredients of a, a coating or a paint um, are comprised of four ingredients, more or less. The, the resin, which is the framework of which the coating's performance is built. Um, pigments, which offer color, hide, and anti-corrosive properties. You have your solvent, which is, allows for that workability and wetting and application of the, the coating. And what that looks like, too, is, you know, the solvent is the solvent in a solvent-borne coating, and water acts as a, a, the solvent in a, a water-based coating. So that's where you're, you're probably looking, if you're looking on the sustainable side, to go towards that water-based coating side because the VOCs are going to be a lot less than what a solvent-based product would offer. 
as well as additional additives, which help to provide additional properties for a coatings formulation. So when we talk about things um, throughout the presentation, it, it's really helpful to understand those key basic ingredients of, of what make up a coating. To talk about VOCs, um, we're going to we're going to talk about that first. And um, there is a Clean Air Act mandate which focuses on solvents, and it's the state's responsibility for establish, establishing compliance. And the federal government can impose sanctions on that. Um, it's at, basically governed by the EPA as an oversight, and it reduces ozone levels by controlling the amount of HAP and VOC levels that are used in products across the country. So you can kind of see that um, in an eight hour ozone classification, there's different, um, and, and most of them are in California, but they're spread a little bit throughout the country um, in regards to that. So there are you know, stricter requirements in, in California and especially Southern California and um, the Northeast than there are in, in the majority of the country. Some of the driving forces um, with regards to paints and coatings and where we're headed are the hazardous air pollutants, which I mentioned HAPS, and these are shop applied. Um, they're select chemicals that can cause adverse effects to the human health and environment. And it's the re requirements of the shop to monitor the amount of HAPS that they're using on an annual basis. And then there are volatile organic compounds or VOCs, which are more governed by the field applied coatings and paints. And that's any organic compound that participates in an atmospheric photochemical reaction, which contributes to ground level ozone formation. So that, that previous um, view of the country that I showed, that's what we're talking about there. Um, as well as paints and coatings have different solvents and thinners that can contain VOCs. So where I said that water-based coatings um, are more on the sustainable side, you, with a solvent-based product, you have to, to think about those different solvents and those the different thinners that are used um, that can contribute to that VOC. So has, hazardous air pollutants, like I mentioned, are in shop applications throughout the United States. There is a list of 188 chemicals that are harmful to the human health and or the environment. And the HAP levels from a manufacturer, a paint and coating manufacturer standpoint, we are um, list those on our data sheet uh, our product data sheet, um, the HAPS level, and it's listed in pounds per gallon solid. And then the shop owners and our coding users are responsible for compliance. So the manufacturer is only responsible for listing that HAP amount on their product data sheet. And then as at the shop level, they're the ones who have to who have to total up basically that amount of HAP to, to make sure that they're in compliance. And um the image here is just showing what on a product data sheet it would look like if you listed that HAP level. Regarding volatile organic compounds or VOCs, this is the, the field applied situation here with regular regulations differ with various states in Canada and the different regulations for shop and field application. Um, so just because it's compliant in the field does not mean it's compliant in the shop and vice versa. Um, and it is up to us as a manufacturer to make sure before we send out a, a coding um, to a, a project or to a contractor that's purchased it that we are in compliance in that particular state regarding if it's applied in the shop or the field and if the, the product meets the VOCs for that particular state. And then, as I mentioned, applicators, manufacturers, and specifiers are responsible for the compliance with that. And here's how it looks on a product data sheet with regards to that. So you're going to see like on a data sheet, you would see the grams per liter VOC or pounds per gallon unthinned and then what it looks like if it's thinned um, a certain percentage. Usually there's a maximum and a minimum thinning. Um, and there are different VOCs uh, regarding that. So you can see using a, 
uh, one uh, number two or number three thinner makes the VOCs higher at 10% thinning versus using number 49 thinner. Regarding major regulatory districts, these are the ones across the country that you might hear a lot or notice um, when you're dealing with uh, projects and VOC requirements. You have AIM, CARB, OTC, South Coast, LADCO, um, Maricopa County, and then the Canada AIM rule. And this might look a little foreign, but we're going to we're gonna go through a little bit um, about what each one of those means and the requirements for those. So VOC regulations for the major air districts. This is just a, a map of the country, and um, it's a little hard to see, I'm sure, on your end. But down at the bottom is a key that, that shows basically what each of those um, air districts falls within and where across the country or in Canada those fall. Um, as I mentioned previously, that the Northeast um, and California are really the big areas that have more stringent VOC regulations. And um, through in a couple other areas throughout the country, um, you see some of those same things, but we'll go into what that means exactly. When you talk about paints and coatings, all of them fall um, as far as application characteristics into an intended use category when you're dealing with HAPs and VOCs. And um, see, these are the typical intended use categories, not all of them, but the typical ones where paints and coatings fall within. Uh, the majority would fall within the industrial maintenance intended use category, but then there are um, like zinc rich primers, would, zinc rich coatings would fall into that zinc rich primers category. Um, and then if it's a floor product in, in a certain regard, as far as use goes, it could be categorized as a floor coating. But a, a manufacturer, a coating or paint manufacturer can help to, to determine for you what intended use category a product will fall into. AIM VOC regulations. These are defined as regulated coatings applied to architectural substrates uh, for functional or decorative purposes and include defined coding categories. So if a product does not fit into a specific category, it's typically classified as a flat or non-flat product. And then products with multiple functions are placed in the most restrictive category. So depending on air district, a product might fall into the industrial maintenance category for all or the most restrictive category, but there might be a certain instance that this product is used for something different that could then be categorized a little bit differently. And as I mentioned, as a, a paint and coating manufacturer can help distinguish that for you. Here's what the national aim um, or national architectural and industrial maintenance rule looks like. There, This is the, um, I guess, most wide known one out there that the majority of the country follows currently. They haven't gotten any stricter with their VOC requirements. And the industrial maintenance category here is 450 grams per liter, which if you're not too familiar with paints and coatings, 450 grams per liter is pretty high. So you can most likely use the majority of, um, I would say, Tanemics paints and coatings for, for that air district. The Ozone Transport Committee, or OTC, has actually two phases, phase one and phase two. And certain, it's important to note that certain states follow phase one and certain states follow phase two. And there is a, a significant difference between, um, especially on the industrial maintenance, grams per liter VOC allowance on um, phase two versus phase one. So at phase one, you have 340 grams per liter um, limit. And then at phase two, you have 250 grams per liter limit. So what that means is you just really have to, to make sure of where, the, where your project is and what phase um, that project falls within in order to determine what products could be used. We mentioned some notes below that say like Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Michigan, New York, Ohio, and Rhode Island follow OTC phase two. Um, and then some certain 
situations within um, Virginia and the counties and cities there also do. And then as well as um, the one, the states that follow phase one. Another area district is LADCO or the Lake Michigan Air District Directors Consortium. And this is another one where you just have to basically pay attention to which one follows which because Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio all are within that LADCO. And Illinois and Indiana follow OTC phase one, whereas Michigan and Ohio follow OTC phase two. And Wisconsin defaults to the national aim. So you have a little bit of all of that. And it's just, again, making sure that you um, know where your project is and what the VOC limits and requirements are. The California Air Resources Board or CARB is also shown here and it falls into, there's actually three different levels um, of VOC requirements for this. And you can see that uh, it's just basically a breakdown of, again, what states follow what and um, what you need to, to pay attention to with regards to that. So there, uh, the lower limits for CARB, the 2019 SEM took effect in January of 2022, but it has not been adopted by any local air districts at this time. So um, right now it's just the 2002 SEM and the 2007 SEM that are really where that is. And if you notice the CARB 2000 seven SEM and OTC phase two that I previously showed you actually match each other. So it's not really as confusing as it seems here, but um, as a manufacturer, we're happy to help walk you through um, those requirements. And then South Coast or Air Quality Management District, and we just call it South Coast most of the time, is the most stringent and it requires industrial maintenance coatings be at 100 grams per liter or less. And like I said, that's just that Southern California area that's considered South Coast. So really you're um, a lot, you have a lot less products to consider with regards to that. And you're really looking at a lot of that. Some solvent base can be used that are under 100 grams per liter, but you're looking at a lot more of that water-based coating technology in those areas. And then the Canada AIM rule, it looks like our, the United States AIM rule, and the industrial maintenance coatings are 340 grams per liter. So that, that honestly looks more like the OTC phase one um, requirements that I previously showed you. So shop rules, um, the national rule is 420 grams per liter BOC for a shop to apply coatings in. The local rules can be more strict, but that's dependent on where you're located throughout the country. And then shops must meet both local BOC as well as those federal HAP rules. And I, I think I mentioned this earlier that specific solvents and thinners are targeted in regulations for that reduction and removal for in-shop application. When we talk about compliant coatings, um, and really what we're looking at here is like that South Coast Air Quality Maintenance District, the strategies for formulating low VOC and low HAP coatings, there, there's three ways to do that. You're looking at higher solids or 100% solids materials. You're looking at coatings with exempt solvents so where you can use certain solvents within the coating formulation that are exempt in certain areas of the country, like Oxol 100, or you're looking at water-based coatings where the water is actually that solvent. And depending on the formulation and how things are changed, there this can affect the application and performance characteristics. So that's just something to be aware of when you're looking at having to change up things as a manufacturer and um, and what coatings you're using that not all of them um, act in the same way and that uh, that that can affect things. So now I'm going to talk about really sustainability and the environmental rating systems that are out there. And um, 
what the driving forces are that are um, pushing coding technology in a certain way. So the environmental rating systems are really um, pushing for product sustainability and transparency and claims. And that's making a, a, a coding manufacturer really look at our products and how we can comply with those requirements. They're, they're really strict requirements regarding like the rating systems and the standards. And it's in the past has caused a wide variety of those coatings to not be compliant. And we, as a manufacturer, must really realign our product offering to comply with those requirements. So as I mentioned, some of the new coating technology that's out there um, really is that high solids and 100% solids products that really allow for better application properties, as well as water-based, which is a lot more friendly for the environment. Um, they really can act as true high performance. A, a lot of the industry is used to using solvent-based and are a little skeptical on the use of water-based coating technology. And um, what we have found um, it by extensive internal testing um, with regards to performance is that a lot of the water-based technology that we have developed is actually performing um, comparable, if not better than the existing solvent-based formulas out there. And then also just being able to have a, a full water-based system that can meet really stringent requirements, water-based zinc, a water-based epoxy, and a water-based acrylic that can meet um, an international standard organization um, ISO 12944 C5 high environment. So that's a pretty um, a, a pretty aggressive ex exterior environment um, where a full water-based system can, can meet that requirement. Some of the industry recognized environmental programs that are out there, um, and some of these don't get mentioned very often or used very often, um, leadership in energy and environmental design, LEED, Living Building Challenge, um, the Collaborative for High Performance Schools, Well Building, um, the International Green Construction Code, you hear Green Globes or Green Guide for Healthcare and Cal Green. Those are all ones that come across my desk quite often. Um, but the really the the true ones are the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, um, the Living Building Challenge Red List, and the Collaborative for High Performance Schools and the Well Building Standard. And I think you guys will probably see through the rest of this presentation that a lot of the requirements for these four um, rating systems all kind of match each other, I guess is the word to say, um, except for the red list. And I'll go into what that means too. But that way you're not thinking, oh gosh, this seems confusing. Um, how do paints and coatings comply with all of these? Um, I'll, I'll explain that. So just a question, true or false, sustainable products with sustainable lifespans will have the least effect on the environment. The answer is true. High performance coatings really can assist in project sustainability and lower performing coatings could require additional applications. Whereas a high performance coating, you might get 20 years of performance and not have to recode it every five years. Whereas the lower performing product, you would have to recoat four times in that 20 year period in order to get the same protection and, and uh, performance. Coatings which provide the longest service life and the lowest life cycle cost can help in minimizing that environmental impact. And I kind of just explained that basically. You're, you're getting actually a better life cycle cost if you're only having to coat one time within that 20 year period versus four times in that 20 year period, because you're not only talking about the cost of the coating or paint or coating itself, but you're talking about surface prep application and um, all of those things considered in as part of that. I'm going to just go over a little bit on the leadership and energy and environmental design requirements and here are the, the rating systems and the versions that are currently out there. 
And we're talking about the version four and 4.1. And we'll talk a little bit about what uh, it, newer versions are, are gonna look like too. But the building design and construction, the interior design and construction, as well as building operations and maintenance, neighborhood development and homes. Most of what I'm talking about today Go, falls into that building design and construction rating system. And before I go any further, we have another poll question. Um, we'll give everybody a couple of seconds to answer, but this is a three part. So um, number one is for paints and coatings, is it important for manufacturers to carry HPDs and EPDs? Those are health product declarations and environmental product declarations. And if you don't know, um, the answers are yes or no, just, just pick one of them. And then number two, are you aware of the local air district VOC requirements for areas of the country your projects are located? Yes or no. And does your firm ever work on living building challenge projects? And the answers are yes or no. And then both feel free to put those up as soon as we get the majority of the the people answering. Awesome, sounds good. I'll give everyone a few more seconds and then we'll we'll quit the poll. All right, I'm gonna end it now and uh, we'll share these results. Okay, so for number one, is it important for manufacturers to carry HPDs and EPDs? It looks like 92% said yes and only 8% said no. And Number two, are you aware of local air district VOC requirements? It sounds seems like uh, a lot more of the majority are not aware um, of the ones in it. Like I said, that just depends on where the pro project is that you're working on at that particular time. And then number three, does your firm ever work on living building challenge projects? And I... Oh, I think it clicked off. I can't, I couldn't, I can't tell. <laughs> Looks like we have a majority said no, but we did have about 23% who said yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, that just gives me an idea of where where you guys are at with things. Um, <clears throat> so we can, we can talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. But now that we've talked about the rating systems, um, really registering projects for LEED certification. New projects looking to achieve certification must register and certify under LEED version 4 or 4.1. And then lead, there is a LEED version 5 that is on the horizon and is estimated in to, to open in 2025. So I don't really have a whole lot of the requirements that and what that looks like for paints and coatings specifically, but I have a feeling it's going to to um, be somewhat in line with what is already required and what we're going over today. So some owners also might choose to build per the lead requirements, but never actually certify their building. So I know uh, we asked the poll about who worked on projects, but that might just be that, you know, they, they're, you have um, a client that's looking for actually um, building per the sustainable requirements, but that's all that they really care about. They're not going for any kind of, you know, building certification or anything of that sort. So lead version four credits that relate to paints and coatings, the sustainable sites, heat island reduction, a roof or non-roof where there's one point possible is one place that um, a coating can be used in order to help in meeting those credits, as well as the indoor environmental quality, low emitting materials. And there are three points possible within that credit, and we'll kind of go into what that looks like. So for lead version four for new construction, there are different categories. I've, as I mentioned, that sustainable sites, you can see that's the no second one on that chart as well as the indoor environmental quality. And there's different points possible within that. Um, a total of 110 points with a 100 point base scale and 10 bonus points. And we'll just talk about what the credits, like I said, for paints and coatings look like, um, not specific to all of these. The points associated with coatings are sustainable sites. Um, also the materials and resources 
um, environmental product declarations, as the poll I just asked you about, materials and resources, sourcing of raw materials, the materials and resources credits for material ingredients or health product declarations, those HPDs, and then indoor environmental quality for the low emitting materials. And from a manufacturer's standpoint, I get asked all the time about all of these. How, how did your coatings um, fall into these categories and, and what credits do they help in achieving within that? So the sustainable sites heat island reduction, there is option one, which is a roof or non-roof, and it allows for two points. And basically what it's saying is that if you use roofing materials, which can be a, a paint or a coating with an SRI equal to or greater to the value that's listed in the chart that you're seeing, um, then you can help in meeting um, a credit within that. So there is a requirement also of if three-year aged SRI value is not available, you can use that initial SRI value. So you would be looking for a paint or coating to meet an initial SRI for a low sloped roof, which is more flat, hence low sloped, um, of 82 and a three-year aged of 64, which SRI stands for solar reflectance index. And then for a steep slope roof, so that's more of an angled roof, you would have uh, an S initial SRI of 39 or a three-year aged SRI of 32. And there are coatings out there that on it, on a scale help in meeting that SRI. So they could, at a steep slope roof with a, a fluoropolymer that contains infrared reflective pigments, you could help in meeting that credit requirement. With regard to the indoor environmental quality low emitting materials credit, there this is worth three points and it, there are seven categories that are included within this. So not just paints and coatings um, or adhesives and sealants. You're looking at flooring. You're looking at furniture. You're looking at insulation. Um, all of those things combined together. But there are two requirements that paints and coatings must meet. And this is on-site inside the weatherproofing of the building. You have to meet the... California Department of Public Health CDPH emissions testing for 90% by volume of the products used on the project, as well as 100% compliance with the VOC requirements. So all of the coatings that are used um, in, in addition to any other products that are used that contain VOCs, you have to meet 100%. This is really where paints and coatings fall into, and that's really it in regards to the paints and coatings portion of the low emitting materials credit. So as I mentioned, the VOC content, all paints and coatings wet applied on site, which means inside that weatherproofing of the building, so for application, must meet the VOC requirements. And we talked about this earlier of CARB 2007 SCM, which is that for industrial maintenance, 250 grams per liter VOC, or South Coast Rule 1113, which looks at 100 grams per liter VOC. So you get a choice, depending on which part of the country your project is in. If it's in South Coast, you have to go with South Coast. If it's outside of South Coast, you can choose to, to use products that meet the CARB requirement of 250 grams per liter less or less. And then you have to have at least 90% of all paints and coatings by volume applied must have California Department of Public Health CDPH emissions testing. And we'll talk about what that looks like as far as documentation that is required of the manufacturer too. As I mentioned, three points possible for the low emitting materials credit. So depending on those seven categories that are there, it, if you achieve two of them, you get one point. If you achieve four categories, you get two and achieve five, you get three. So the paints and coatings, remember, is just one of those seven categories. With regard to the materials and resources credit, 
you, I know in the poll, you guys said that you feel like those are important um, for a manufacturer to have, and we'll go into what that means. The materials and resources credits demand more pertinent information for manufacturers, and credits require manufacturers reveal what's in their coatings and the hazards associated with them. The environmental product declarations, or the EPDs, this credit really encourages the use of products and materials which have readily available um, life cycle information. The EPDs are really a summary document of data collected in a life cycle assessment. And through that, an EPD enables a comparison of a category of products on environmental impacts like carbon emissions and things of that nature. This credit requires that 20 permanently installed products from five different manufacturers be used on the project. So what that means is if you have 50 products on your project that you're using, not just paints and coatings, but 50 products in, all together, and you can obtain 20 product or 20 EPDs from 20 products, then you could still use products that don't have an EPD on a project. It just it's easier as an architect or a specifier to say, well, I know this manufacturer has an EPD, so I want to just stick with them. Once you get those, it's a little bit easier, but I'm just letting you guys know that there is still that feasibility if you can achieve that credit otherwise. Also sourcing of raw materials. This combines recycled content and regional materials. And the credit requires the use of products from manufacturers that have publicly released a report of their raw material suppliers. With regard to health product declarations, it looks very similar, um, a different document, but very similar to the requirements for the environmental product declarations, whereas um, the HPDs provide a standardized ways for building product manufacturers to report contents chemical hazards, emissions, and health effects of their products to the public. So this is where us as a manufacturer would produce a document called an HPD that talks about all the ingredients that are in our formulation. This credit requires 20 permanently installed products from five different manufacturers be used on the project. Very similar to what the EPD requirement is. And again, also very achievable um, and also the ability to be able to use other products that don't have an HPD if the, the situation arose and you could meet that otherwise. With uh, the newer rating system, before version 5 comes out, the, the newest rating system is LEED version 4.1, and this was never actually completely publicized. It is still on a pilot basis, and the option is that projects that are, you, you know, going for lead version 4 could use version 4.1 um, credits in lieu of. So if they wanted to use the low emitting materials credit, they could um, from version 4.1. The difference is actually with the version 4.1 rating system, the requirements for paints and coatings got a little less stringent. So if you remember from version four, the low emitting materials credit said that 90% of all paints and coatings by volume must meet the VOC emissions, the CDPH emissions testing. And with version 4.1, it, it changed to 75% of all paints and coatings. And the same requirement is still true for the VOCs. It still requires 100% um, to meet the VOC content evaluation. But it did, it did recognize that it's somewhat difficult for manufacturers of paints and coatings to get the CDPH emissions testing. It's a third-party test that costs... Um, money and um, the evaluation of it. So they're they're realizing that it wasn't as easy to achieve that 90% and changed it to 75%. In addition to LEED, there's also the Living Building Challenge and the Red List, which there are two portions of this that paints and coatings fall within. The Healthy Interior Performance, instead of credits, the Living Building Challenge works in uh, 
they call it pedals. And there's a healthy interior performance pedal or materials imperative number eight, which paints and coatings are required to meet the same VOC and emissions requirements as LEED. So those same requirements that we just went through. And then there is another pedal that talks about red list, um, materials imperative number 13, which requires the use um, manufacturers to avoid red list chemicals in 90% of the project's new materials by cost. So it's basically a very stringent um, red list of chemicals that you cannot have in your products. And as a manufacturer of paints and coatings, which no, we all know have quite a bit of um, ingredients and chemicals that help that coating perform, it is a lot um, harder and more difficult for us to comply with the red list requirements. With regards to manufacturer's documentation, so um, projects that are going for LEED certification or other sustainable rating systems do require documentation. And um, a spe specification for a LEED project requires that documentation from a product manufacturer um, to comply with those requirements. So that looks at VOC content, um, that looks at CDPH emissions testing, as well as other aspects. Firms typically have a material and VOC reporting form to complete with the documentation. And from a manufacturer standpoint, we fill those out all day long. Um, so that's nothing new to us. We also have um, documents on our website that help in showing you exactly what that is. But other manufacturers, I also know, have that same documentation. Coding manufacturers should have that documentation readily available and easily accessible. Other rating systems, some projects may register for certification under LEED and the Living Building Challenge. And what that looks like is the requirements for LEED and Living Building are different. And I mentioned that they're somewhat similar, but there are aspects of it that are different. And just because a product complies with one doesn't necessarily mean it complies with both. So now that we've talked about um, the VOCs across the country, what the um, sustainable rating systems looks like, I just want to talk in general about other considerations with regards to specifications and performance. So when writing specifications, it's important to uh, write performance-based specifications really with the standards and minimum result requirements. The degree of um, performance that you're going to get from writing a performance specification really helps to assure that sustainable, high quality products are used on the project. If you don't provide performance, um, it it really doesn't allow for your project to know that you're getting that, that high quality um, specification and performance. It's important to place the coatings in Division 9, Section 099600, which is high-performance coatings. And it's also important to, if you have a primer that's specified in Division 5, to cross-reference with Division 9 in the high-performance section. Because if a primer that's not compatible with that top coat, you know, intermediate and top coat system that was done in Division 5 in, in the shop, and it comes to the field and it has a, a non-compatible primer that's supposed to go with that intermediate and top code, it can be a, a, a bad situation. Seek assistance for side-by-side -side comparisons. And what, what I mean by that is just where you have a particular product that's specified and say they're wanting to do a substitution and they have that product sitting side-by-side -side with the product that's specified so that it's easy for comparison with regards to the product attributes as well as the performance attributes of the products. So what to consider also on specifications, um, I think I mentioned this throughout the presentation a few times, to think about life cycle value, the cost of a coding system based on the length of its service life. Um, we'll talk about that 20 year, you know, one coat versus four repaints in that 20 year period, you're, you're not getting the same performance out of that coating system. The coating systems that are required to be replaced more often 
um, from a corrosion or aesthetic reason, you know, will have more impact on the environment. And then different generic coating types, whether that be an epoxy, an acrylic, polyurethane, they really all have very different performance attributes. So just because you have an epoxy specification um, from one manufacturer and they want to substitute an epoxy, you, you really need to vet that out. And, you know, those, those products could be totally different, even though the generic coating type is categorized as epoxy. The distinct variations can exist between those different formulations, as I said, within that same generic type. And then I just wanted to go over some sustainable project highlights, just so you guys could see some of the ones where um, paints and coatings have been used. So here is the Southwater Purification Plant in Chicago, Illinois, and a low VOC, high performance coating system was used on the Southwater Purification Plant which um, back when LEED version 2.2 was um, in, in service, I guess, it achieved that certification. This is the Anaheim Regional Transportation Intermodal Center, or otherwise known as Arctic. The welded cross members inside the transportation hub protected with a long lasting and low VOC emissions tested coating system. And this pro project pursued LEED Platinum certification. This is the Hills Pet Nutrition Small Paws Facility. The, in, it's located in Topeka, Kansas and the interior and exterior substrates, concrete, CMU and steel all utilized low VOC and emissions tested high performance coatings to achieve LEED Silver certification. This is the Candata building at Georgia Tech. The Candata building for innovative sustainable design is the first building in Georgia and the 28th in the world to earn Living Building Challenge certification. This is one where I was talking about they did both as well as lead version for platinum certification. The building's exposed structural steel and concrete floors receive low VOC, red list free coatings to help meet the mini stringent building requirements. This is a county jail and the cells and toilets rooms received a low VOC and emissions tested high performance coating system that met the owner's requirements for sustainability. And that is in Batavia, New York. So you can see those are a wide range of projects throughout the country that utilized paints and coatings in different ways to achieve, you know, sustainable um sustainability, long-term performance, as well as meet the um, lead rating system requirements. So we have um, a couple of other polls um, that are generated in one here. So let's talk about um, environmental regulations poll. Number one, would you like to receive follow-up information from Tanemic, whether that be a price quote, lead time, technical or installation information, product literature, sample, and certifications. So if you would like to just check one of those. And then number two is this inquiry regarding um, number one, an active project, a future project, general research, or a firm library. So those will help me understand what you guys need in your follow-up. Um, after the webinar as well. So, perfect. And then, as far as closing remarks, um, the environmental regulations pertaining to paints and coatings are dynamic and really ever changing. And it's always important to consult your product representative or Tanemic in general for the most current information. And then there are several rating system projects can register. Um, we've talked about a few of those today, and it's important to know which system and version your project's working towards as the requirements can be very different between those rating systems. And specifying high performance coatings can have a substantial impact on a project and provide long lasting aesthetic value to the underlying substrate. 
So those are all really things to think about when you're talking about sustainability and um, not just, you know, meeting the, the rating system requirements, but just in general, really understanding the what your project's trying to achieve. Is it just caring to check off boxes to meet a sustainability rating system? Or is it really about the longevity, the, the cost um, aspects in, you know, long-term performance and life cycle value of that system? So those can work hand in hand. We've showed you that today with regard to some of the projects I showed at the end, so. And I think that is it. All right, great. Um, so we do have a few minutes left for some questions and I do see so we have some folks have submitted some. Um, do have a question, now's a good time to throw it into the Q&A so that um, we can either get to it today or get to it after today's webinar. Um, so I'll start off with from Michael, do you offer assistance with specification writing? Yes, we, we um, are, we, to Nemec, sells our coatings through independent sales agencies across the country and either Tanemic's corporate headquarters where I'm located or the local rep in your territory can definitely help in and help in writing or reviewing your current specifications. All right. And then so many of our steel bridges and highway overpasses are allowed to go to rust. Does Tanemic sell products to address this short-sighted lack of maintenance? So, so Tanemic has not done uh, an overwhelming amount of bridges in the past. We've dabbled in it, but there are certain requirements, um, testing requirements that bridges, coatings for bridges have to meet, um, like NetPEP or NetCoat. And we do, we do actually have a couple bridges in um, the process right now that are utilizing a, a zinc epoxy fluoropolymer system for the bridge. So yes, we, we are able to have, we, or we have products that are able to meet some of those requirements and we're doing ongoing testing to help in meeting some of the DOT and um, state regulated requirements for bridge coding. So we can help you along, along the way with that. Awesome. Great. All right. We've got just a few minutes left. So if there are any other questions, uh, throw them in the chat now. Um, all right, we've got another one. Any particular product part of the prep process? Product part of the, I'm not sure I understand that. Yeah, I think um, if you could clarify a little bit what you mean there, Vince, um, we'll get you an answer. Um, or also feel free to raise your hand if you would uh, like to clarify out loud, we can do that as well. Any particular product part of the prep process? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what that one means. Um, but yeah, if you can give I'd us some- say there's de definitely lots of different products and there's different prep required as part of that process. And it just depends on the product or system that's being used as to, to what the required prep is for that. Okay, they gave that, us a little- That might be the answer, I don't know. <laughs> uh, about, they said before applying the primer. Okay, yeah, it, and that would be a, dependent on what the primer is in order for us to determine what that prep requirement is. So it's project and product and system. <laughs> it's all about that, all of the above, yeah, yeah, as to what the requirements are. But yep, we can definitely help help along. And as Bo mentioned at the beginning, if you guys want to reach out um, through the portal and ask questions, you know, on a particular project or whatnot, please please feel free to do so. And we'll make sure we get you um, connected with a local rep for further information. Awesome, yeah. And I'll actually throw a link in the chat right now so that y'all can uh, head to that page directly. Um, and also wanna mention there is a post-event survey. So if you can fill that out, there'll be another spot to ask any follow-up questions there. Um, but yeah, just dropped a link to the Tanemic page on Ace Lab in the chat. So feel free to head over there after today's event and uh, ask any follow-up questions that you might have directly. Um, all right, so it looks like we've got just a minute left. So I just want to thank everyone so much for coming out today and joining us. And thank you, Jennifer, for such a great presentation. Um, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone in the audience did as well. Um, so thank you so much. And I hope yeah, everyone- Thanks for having me. Today. Awesome. All right. See y'all later. Thanks.